Hello everyone. As many of you may know, Kubernetes is designed to have redundancy when a node goes down in the cluster. However, this still has an impact on our applications. But what is that impact and how can we best deal with it when the situation occurs? In this video, I'm going to discuss that and more. So please stick around and we will get into the details. First of all, what happens when a node goes down? After a single minute, the node is marked not ready. And we can check that when we run kubectl describe nodes or kubectl get nodes. After five minutes, the pods are marked unknown or node lost. We have the option to configure pod eviction timeout in Cube Controller Manager in these cases. So this will control the amount of time it takes between uh, the node going down and the pod being essentially reprovisioned in a on a different node. Kubernetes automatically evicts pods and recreates them. As I mentioned, um, that is something that we can configure. However, for stateful applications, this is a little bit more complex because we have to deal with the volumes that they are in control of. After one minute again, node is marked not ready, pods are marked unknown or lost. Kubernetes evicts pods. The old pod, however, may get stuck in a terminating state. In fact, generally this is what happens when a node goes down. The pod isn't actually removed from the cluster. It is set to a terminating state as per the Kubernetes API. And if we want to actually remove that object from Kubernetes, we have to either reboot the, the node and drain it, or we have to delete the node entirely. When the pod is stuck in that terminating state, the volume for that pod is still associated with the old pod. This means that the new pod will not be able to mount the volume because it's already in use. A solution for this is to use something like Portworks, which is a third party tool that allows intelligent volume provisioning and management. From a high level, we now understand what happens when a node goes down, the sort, the steps that we will observe. But how does it actually work under the hood? Well, the first thing that we can look at is node heartbeats. These are what's used to determine the availability of the node, and they come in two forms. They are status updates, and these happen every five minutes. So when we run kubectl get nodes, we can verify the status and after five minutes it will have changed and we will see that the node is not in a healthy state. However, Kubernetes also uses the lease API, and I discussed this in a prior video, to update the state of the node every 10 seconds, or essentially kubelet will monitor the state of the node and then it will send an update request to the least API, and that will tell Kubernetes whether the node is healthy or not. We do have some configuration options when it comes to how the nodes will behave when they are detected to go down. So the first option that we have is to use the API server config and set the default node not ready toleration seconds. What that configuration option does is it sets a blanket policy for the entire cluster on the number of seconds that we should wait before evicting a pod when it is not ready or moving the pod to another node. And this second configuration option is the amount of time that we allow uh, the node to be in an unreachable state. So again, node not ready and node unreachable are two different uh, conditions that the node can be in. However, if we want to set the time that it takes to evict the pod based on individual applications and allow those to differ, we can actually set this configuration parameter using tolerations. Here we have an example, node.kubernetes.io slash unreachable. So when a node becomes unreachable, we give 10 seconds leeway before evicting the pod, moving it elsewhere. So in this case, we're using the minimum possible uh, timeout in order to bring the application back online as quickly as possible. Now, when a node goes down, 
there is some manual intervention that may be required. However, there is tooling that has been developed that allows us to circumvent some of the manual intervention that might be needed. Some of these tools I will now go through. The first one is Node Problem Detector. Node Problem Detector is a daemon for monitoring and reporting on node health. It monitors logs in order to identify problems and it allows us to use various configurable daemons to detect problems. And then the problems are sent to exporters and we have exporters for the Kubernetes API, Prometheus and Stackdriver as the notes say. So to recap, problem detector will sit in our cluster on each node. It will monitor logs different log files that we can configure. Based on the content of those logs, it will export to either the Kubernetes API. If it sends to the Kubernetes API, then events will be generated or node conditions will be generated. If it's sent to Prometheus or Stackdriver, alerts can then be generated. Another tool with a similar function to no problem detector is Skuro. However, Skuro takes a slightly different approach and a different direction to a node problem detector in that it receives alerts from alert manager. So Skuro assumes that you're using Prometheus and alert manager in order to generate your uh, alerting within your cluster. Then it receives those alerts and based on the alerts, it generates node conditions. And we can define custom node conditions and there are an array of tools out there that poll the Kubernetes API for their node conditions, then take action upon them. And I will now talk about two of those tools that we can use. The first one is Drano. As the name suggests, Drano is designed to drain nodes. It detects node conditions and drains nodes accordingly. So in combination with Skuro, as I mentioned in the prior slide, this will give us kind of a full implementation in terms of the ability to drain nodes based on certain conditions. If we detect uh, some unrecoverable error, like a memory error or something like that, we may decide, okay, we need to drain this node, get all of the workloads off of it. However, that can now be done simply by setting up an alert, deploying Skuro into our Kubernetes cluster, configuring it, and then allowing Drano to do the rest. There will be no manual intervention whatsoever. So this is a, a really useful set of tools that you can implement if you're trying to reduce the kind of operational workload that you, you will have in your organization. There are a configurable set of conditions and labels that trigger a drain. So we could say perhaps there are two concurrent alert types that have to be firing. If those alert types are firing, Skuro will then set node conditions. And then if those two node conditions are firing, Drano will drain the node. The node is immediately cordoned upon, the, upon Drano detecting those node conditions. And then we can actually configure the amount of time before going ahead and draining the node. So, it may be the case that we don't want to immediately drain the node. We want to ensure that the problem is persistent for a period of maybe five, 10 minutes before removing all of the workloads. Finally, we will look at Cured, which is a Kubernetes reboot daemon. So with Cured, there's a slightly different approach. It watches for the creation of a file on the node, a reboot file, in this case, the file just has to exist and then Curd will know that the node needs to be rebooted. It then cordons and drains the node prior to a reboot. It utilizes a lock to ensure that only a single node is rebooted at a time and it uncordons the node afterwards. So it's sort of left down to you as to how you go about creating the reboot file based on what conditions but uh, it's not a particularly difficult thing to do. So again, quite a useful tool, and particularly because it allows us to ensure that only a single node is being rebo rebooted at a time or undergoing maintenance at a time, um, because that's obviously something that we 
do not we don't don't want you know three of our nodes being drained in a five node cluster at any one time so that is my video on node outages what happens during node outages and how we can solve problems during node outages using automation i hope that was useful if you have any questions please leave a comment and i'll get straight back to you please like and subscribe and i will talk to you in the next video